Eve. And also it says here, behind the wizard curtain in the Wizard of Oz, we were going to see behind the curtain as all that has been hidden came to the surface and we could see what's been going on that we didn't know about. As I say, 20 years ago, no sign of that whatsoever. Today, it's extraordinary what's uh, coming out all the time. And the reason for this, I would suggest, is that we're going through a change of epoch, a change of age. I mean, people have talked about the Aquarian age and people talk about 2012. These are all different kind of symbols for the same thing which is that we're moving from one vibrational therefore information age into another one as the vibration the base vibration changes so different information is being uh, c communicated by the suns uh, in the same principle as what the, they call in in Asia the yuga some people call it an age some people call it an epoch it's a different period of experience which is brought about by a different information construct which we then decode into a new world, a new experience. Um, and we are moving out of a period, an epoch of control and suppression uh, into one that is about expansion and, and amazing awareness and potential. And at the moment we're standing right at the cusp where the, these energies are changing uh, place, but they're both still available. So you've got people tuning to the old epoch and they're still seeing the world as they've seen it before. They're still seeing the, the world through the left brain. They're still seeing the world as the television news tells them. And then there's others, and my goodness me, are they increasing around the world ever faster. Um, they are starting to pick up the information uh, of the new truth vibrations, the new uh, information uh, of the new epoch, and they are seeing the world in a completely different way. And I was told that this was going to happen 20 years ago, when I kind of staggered bewildered into this new life that suddenly unfolded upon me uh, in 1990. As the energies change, as the information changes, we are changing, and uh, the, the earth is changing in the sense that this new energy is starting to impact itself upon the energy ley line meridian system and for those who are open to it because it's a vibration you have to tune to uh, like everything else it's starting to impact on the information decoding system of, of, the, of the body computer and it's offering us a way out of this prison this mind prison that's been uh, imposed upon us all the way through this this old epoch uh, right up to the present day and so as we um, decode the new information we create a new world a new experience you know if 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 you put um, a, a computer disk in a computer a software disk um, and you play it it will play on the screen in relation to the information that's on the disk but when you change the disk the same information is not going to go on the, on the screen at the old one. It's going to be something new on the screen because it's different information. This is the principle of what's going on now. And the question is, are we going to tune with it and go down that road? Or are we going to just stay with the old and go down that road, this dying epoch that's uh, going to be replaced by this new one as we move through what we call years and the time, uh, linear time. The, uh, the sun goes through various uh, cycles of more radiation and... Uh, more sunspot activity and solar flares and, and through periods of lower ones. Um, so the solar maximum of radiation in the sunspot cycle, the last one ended around March 2001. It was in the run-up to that. They were saying, look, global warming, it's getting warmer. And then we go down into another cycle. This is the, supposed to be the solar minimum in uh, January 2005, and that's why the temperature has been falling. Uh, through the years since and, and suddenly global warming becomes climate change because it's not warming um, and there's been a period now of really strange inactivity on the sun because by now we should be into a new uh, cycle of sunspot activity and, and, and upward um, emissions from the sun but as one scientific magazine said there is no one alive today that has lived through a longer period of such low sunspot activity that we've been going through since uh, 2001. This is the uh, sunspot activity on the sun yesterday. Again, not very much. But the predictions are 
that there's going to be a massive solar flare activity in, in the, the coming period. In fact, out of the blue yesterday, the defense minister in Britain suddenly announced that there could be major problems with, uh, with solar activity affecting computer systems and military computer systems. And it's like, where did that come from? Obviously, um, he's been told something. The point is, however, that whether we go, we're going through a big solar cycle or a down solar cycle, that's not really, um, that's not really kind of the basic or basis of the truth vibrations. The truth vibrations are a vibrational change. So whether there's an upturn in the sun or a downturn in the sun, the truth vibrations com are coming through anyway as a vibrational change. And as we connect with them, they're bringing great change to us if we will allow them to. Uh, me and my uh, artist friend Neil Haig, we are symbolizing these truth vibrations as a lion. Um, because one of the things that, that, that they're, they're going to do and are doing in people is to bring out the, the if you like, the lion uh, level of people. So they, they no longer acquiesce. Once you start tuning to this new epoch, this new information epoch, it's not about acquiescing anymore. It's not about being afraid of authority or, or keeping your head down or your mouth shut because what will people think of me? No, no, that's the old epoch of fear and, and acquiescence and what will people say about me? No, no, this is the lion coming out. And these, um, these uh, truth vibrations, as I call them, are, if we're going to tune to them, if we choose to, are going to transform our perception of self and the world, our potential, what we can do, um, and it's happening. I'm, a, I'm fortunate in that, first of all, um, I started this journey before any of this was obvious, and now it's absolutely blatant wherever I go. I mean, when I walked out here this morning, I thought, I, I was genuinely shocked at the number of people here. Because there was a time, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, even, even 10 years ago, where, you know, there were times when I, I, I would have had room to walk around in a phone box and still talk. I, I've spoken in Chicago to eight people. <laughs> and, and then, but, but I've seen this, this change going on as people start to open their minds to things they would have just rejected before because there's a new awareness emerging. It's a wonderful time to be alive as we start to ha have the opportunity to, to, to literally build a new world, to, to decode a new world. And one of the things it's doing, like I say, um, and this is what the whole conspiracy research movement is coming out of and all the stuff we talked about today, it's opening the curtain and saying, hey, this is what's been going on behind your back. This is how you've been controlled all these years. And it's happening. You know, when, when you get told this is going to happen 20 years ago, and you're thinking, well, I'll go with it, but I'm not so sure. Are you really, are you on it? Are it really going to happen? And then 20 years later, it's happening. And these truth vibrations, this vibrational change as is going into these, these dark places, these places where the energy of the old epoch is controlled from. When the secret societies and this Satanism and, and all these, 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 uh, low, low cesspit vibrational expressions of this whole epoch in the control system. And it's going to, as we move through this period now, um, it's, it's not going to seem like, it's going to seem for a few little years yet that the control system's moving on and moving on. But there's going to come a tipping point when it's coming down. And it's coming down because its information basis is going out and being replaced by another one, which it doesn't do control systems and power over. So this uh, whole control system mechanism that I've been describing today, um, this vibrational change is going to bring it to an end because uh, its uh, vibrational basis is disappearing. It's being dismantled. And it's funny that we think that the control system is getting more powerful, and on the surface it is. But then you ask the question, why is this control system throwing everything at us just at the time that this energetic change is coming, which is waking people up to see the control system? That is not by accident. It is by the fact that the control system, which appears to be getting stronger and stronger, is actually desperately throwing its last cards 
to try to hold on to a power structure which has got no chance of survival. No chance. Because a new energy is being breathed into this uh, control mechanism and it's going to break up. It is breaking up. It's not the majority yet, but m the, the numbers that are waking up and seeing it now is just fantastic. And as we um, work with this new energy, as we become uh, affected by the new energy and the lion energy comes out, no more acquiescence, no more fear, no more little me, then that expression in the holographic realm of the, the vibrational change in the metaphysical universe, if you like, together is going to bring this control system to an end. And that's why these people, for all their arrogance and for all their uh, apparent power, are terrified of humans waking up. That's why Don Juan Matos, the, the, the shaman in the Castaneda books, was talking about this constant fear that the predator race has of humans waking up and seeing what's going on. So, as I said earlier, they can see down the timeline. They can see further down the timeline than we can, what we call a timeline. They knew this change was coming. And so they have timed this control blitz to try to hold the lid on awakening humanity. Because they were fine before. They were controlling humanity fine. And humanity had no idea they were being controlled by that force. That could have gone on indefinitely. And so they, they would have been quite happy for it just to continue as it was. What has happened, however, is as this, uh, they knew this vibrational change was coming and the potential effect it would have, They've tried, they're trying now to throw everything at us to hold on to the power they've had all this period, not to gain more, although that's what it seems on the surface, it's to try to hold on to the power they already have. And that's why they, that, that we have um, had a time uh, here now where just as this vibrational change is really starting to motor, so the control system is throwing everything at us to, that is no accident, no coincidence, those two things are happening together. Because the, the old epoch of the, what I call the moon matrix and the um, control of the human mind collectively and manipulation of it, as this, these truth vibrations impact themselves upon our reality, this is no longer enough. Because like I said earlier, if you can awaken uh, vibrationally beyond this uh, moon matrix as I call it, the control system in general, which is a vibrational construct, then it no longer affects you. That's why they're trying to keep us in the vibrational box so we keep being affected. And what we're seeing now with all the Orwellian control and the, the stuff they're giving to us to, to destabilize us through food and drink and electromagnetic pollution and all this stuff is equivalent to that. They're trying to batten down the watertight doors to stop the vibrational impact on the human psyche. In other words, to stop us having the ability to decode this new information. And uh, one, of the, one of the ways that they're doing it, I'm sure, is, is manipulating the Earth's magnetic field to try to deflect frequencies that will um, have an effect upon us in terms of waking us up. So all these things that we've been talking about today all these things from uh, GM food, microchips, the stuff in we eat, the drugs, the mobile phone and magnetic pollution, it's all designed to do one thing. It's to destabilize the body computer so we don't get the full impact of this magnificent change that is now unfolding. Our kids and grandkids are not going to live in an Orwellian state. They're not going to live in a global fascist uh, dictatorship. They're not. This, we're in the period now where this thing is going. It's going because its informational basis is going. And for me, there are many reasons for this technology, which has been widely uh, written about in recent years, the last 15 years particularly, called HARP, based in Alaska, but they're now building other ones in other places. And what HARP does is bounce radio waves off the ionosphere, the upper level of the atmosphere, and back down to Earth. And yes, it can manipulate the weather. Yes, it can manipulate earthquakes and many other things. But I, I say that its true foundation reason for being there is to pour uh, or support 
the suppression of the Earth's energy field vibrationally so that we do not again get the full impact of this truth vibrational change. It's to, it's to underpin all the other ways that it's been suppressed up to this point. And I'm sure that, uh, again, if, if whatever heart does to the Earth's uh, energy field, then we are interacting with that all the time and decoding it through the um, computer system of the body, and therefore we're affected by it. And I'm sure that what's coming out of the chemtrails all over the world is also linked to this. It's almost like they're trying to create some sub-vibrational reality around the, uh, around the earth, the, the level that we all live in, to, uh, as a barrier to this vibrational change. They've long known as co is coming, this epoch change, because it's just a natural part of this, um, this, this uh, experience, this reality, this time loop. What is happening with this vibrational change is that schism from which all the world changed as a result of it from what it was before is being healed what these truth vibrations do as you as you tune to them is they heal you within um, and together they're healing this schism and if we will open to them they are healing or will heal the schism in the human psyche which has caused so much mayhem it's the schism that manifests through from the vibrational through to the holographic in all this stuff. Wars, conflicts, hunger in a world of plenty, self-obsession, uh, uh, arguments, anger, frustration. And it's the schism on uh, energy on which the control system is built. Without that, the world couldn't be as it is. If the energetic foundation of this, this reality was harmonious, then the control system couldn't mani uh, manifest because it's a manifestation of disharmony, of distortion, distorted values that want control over, distorted perceptions of me, me, me. And in effect, the, what's happening with the, tr the, the vibrational change is a piece in the puzzle, the hack, the firewall, which was taken out or imposed upon us so that we... Uh, the, 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 our awareness narrowed is being put back and it won't all happen overnight tomorrow this is the period we're in and every year will get more and more powerful until it flips and the truth vibrations the new information epoch will be the dominant one and then the, tr the control system must fall and this whole uh, uh, cycle of suppression and imposition and ignorance and little me will be over. We're moving to a period as we awaken to our true nature from seeing everything as apart from everything else, left brain, to seeing everything as one. So when we hurt someone else, we're hurting ourselves. When someone hurts us, they're hurting themselves. Because we're all one consciousness expressing itself in different ways. And when we realize that we are one rather than division, rather than parts, have to fight and compete with each other, then the way that we live our lives uh, changes. And all these things like wars, control systems, uh, killing children, uh, famine, uh, in, in, in a world of abundance, they're all expressions of the schism, the distortion. And so when people say, it's just human nature, that's what it, no, it's not human nature. It's distorted human nature. That's why the values and the way the world is, is distorted. As this schism heals, so we are moving away from all that. And we'll realize what the real nature of humans is. Not what we've seen. Not death and destruction and me, me, me. But an incredible genius, ma magical being which is what the uh, shaman was talking about. It's what the, the, the legends and, and accounts all around the ancient world were about. This golden age when humanity uh, was this amazing being before the so-called fall of man. Now, of course, given that I've been talking about these, uh, this vibrational change for 20 years, when people start talking about 2012 and the Mayan calendar and oh, a great and the end of an one era and age and the start of another one 
I should be jumping around saying, told you, told you, 2012, told you. But I'm not saying that. I think, I think 2012 is being massively overplayed. I'm not saying there won't be events in 2012 because two years from now, or what, one and a half years from now anyway, the truth vibrations will have impacted themselves more. So things are going to be moving on. But for me, the real significance of 2012 is that it's not 20, the, um, 2012, it's not 2011. Um, but it's not 2013 either, and it's not 2014 and 2015 and 2016, as this, this, this change um, moves on. So I think it's being overplayed, but that's, that's fine if it gets people talking about the vibrational change that's underway, because it certainly is. And we're moving to this point where the irresistible force, the vibrational change, is coming face to face with what thinks it's the immovable object, the control system, but it ain't. And we're starting to look each other in the eye. And we're going to see more and more of this. The control system's going to come under more and more challenge and more and more pressure and more and more questioning as we move through this period. As the, the, the new energy, the new information epoch becomes more and more impacting upon human society, human perception and the world in which we live. There is a change in the ocean of energy that we are living in and decoding. It's, it's, it's a new flow and it's getting faster. And we have a choice here um, of getting on the, in the canoe or the airbed and lying back and, and enjoying the adventure, where it's going to go, how the world's going to change, how our perceptions are going to expand. Whoa, I never realized that. I've never uh, seen that before. Isn't that incredible? And, and all these things that are going to be happening, it's going to be an amazing world we're moving into. Or we can try to, to hold the status quo at a time when the energy status quo is changing, the information status quo is changing. And if we do that, then we're going to be using more and more energy just to stand still and hold on to, to, to life as we think it should be. And eventually, the flow is going to get so symbolically quick and fast, and people call it the quickening, it's the quickening of the vibration, that it's going to do this to the control system, wash it away. And we're going we're gonna to start, as, as we're affected by it, more and more people, it's happening to them now, never mind going to, we're going to be um, becoming aware of many other levels of ourselves, many other levels of reality, where we can um, access insight and inspiration um, and intuitive knowing. And the world in our heads is changing as a result of that, those of us who are, or those people that are waking up. The control system, the Illuminati, loves to use this phrase for their new order, a new dawn. Well, there is a new dawn, but it's not what they think it is. It's a new dawn of human awareness, a new dawn of human consciousness. We have gone through this process where we once were connected um, to our wider awareness. We've seen this control system move in, and now we're going to see the reverse as we awaken and return to the true nature of the human being as we move further into what we call the future a human being that today's human being would not even begin to recognize that's not possible to do that that's impossible it's matter of fact when you expand your consciousness from the uh, five sense body mind level and this uh, control system is being dismantled vibrationally through information it is going. And we're now in this wonderful period where humanity is standing up more and more and stretching itself and breaking the chains that have held us in servitude all this time. It's a wonderful, wonderful time to be alive and to to. to, to experience this change that's coming and the challenges that are coming in the in the in the shorter term big time is the control system is like a cornered rat and it's going to throw everything at us uh, to try to um, hold on to its power as einstein said you cannot solve problems with the same level of consciousness that created them and through this this epoch of suppression that we've been through and control 
we've had a level of consciousness that has created problems and then some other people have come in with the same level of consciousness called a new, another political party or another religion or whatever. Same level of consciousness, different name, and they've not solved the problems, they've made them bloody worse. Why? Because it's the same level of consciousness. And, and we're now at the point where a new level of consciousness is emerging, a new awareness. So instead of saying it's, it's impossible, they're, they're impossible problems to solve, no they're not. Most of them are manufactured problems and the rest are caused by ignorance of reality and self. As we move into this expanded state of awareness, what we call impossible problems to overcome will be gone. And it's not, it's not that we have to uh, uh, um, find enlightenment, we're already enlightened. We're already all that is, has been, and ever can be. What we've done is allow barriers of belief system and preconceived ideas to keep us vibrationally from connecting with that infinity that we already are. And that means breaking the spell. Breaking the spell on the human psyche, because that's what it is, a spell that's been cast upon the human psyche to keep us in an hypnotic trance so we forget the true genius magnificence of who we are. And these are the people, most of them unknowingly, who have cast the spell as middlemen and women for that which is truly casting the spell in the background. The programming of our perception. So the first step of freedom is to disconnect ourselves from the perception manipulation that we've been undergone. To disconnect ourselves from this matrix of control and fundamentally to disconnect ourselves from the massive influence that the reptilian brain has on human behavior, perception and reality. What is the... What is the, the, the the basis of the reptilian brain. It's survival. It's based on fear. We need to be, when we're in states of fear, we go into a survival response reptilian brain. It gives us insecurity because the reptilian brain's always insecure because it's always looking around, what's the next danger? So when we go into the reptilian brain level of, of perception or uh, reality reading, then we go into states of insecurity because that's what the reptilian brain is and anxiety too, this anxiety that people have. And you can, you, you can, you, you can feel anxiety and not have any idea. Why am I feeling anxiety? My life's going fine. I'm, but why do I feel anxious? Because this is talking to us all the time. And the, and the reptilian brain is always anxious. For the, again, it's always looking, there's always a problem to find, always a danger to find. That's, that's its whole mechanism, its whole system. And therefore, when we go into the reptilian brain state of reality, we are going into big time into the control system's collective mind that is there to turn their mind into our mind. And so, overriding the reptilian brain. The reptilian brain does not think. It does not work things out. It reacts. That's what it does. So when we fall into behavior responses, where we're reacting to situations, not deep breath, think it through, let's have a look at this calmly, that disconnects us from the reptilian brain and its impact, and its impact on our behavior and response. So one of the, you know, we have this, this phrase, you know, uh, if you, when you get angry, count to 10. Well, let's try 20, that might be better. But, if, and, and you, you, always, you keep getting caught because that's our natural response mechanism. But the more you work this through, I know from experience, you take a deep breath. When you're faced with a situation where you'd normally go, bang, reaction, survival. You can't say that about me. Oh, my God, what's going on? Oh, my God, global warming. Oh, my God. What about the economy? And Oh, my God. You go, okay, I'm looking at this calmly. I'm going I'm to think this through, and then I'm going to make a calm decision on how I respond to this. Now, other parts of the brain and the mind are impacting upon our behavior. We're no longer controlled from this thing, which, which I mean, th th this, this is panic. 
This is the genetic version of panic, the reptilian brain. So the more we could calmly think things through, not react, not re react with emotional immediate responses, we're disconnecting from that um, impact on our behavior of that reptilian brain, which is the microchip through which the collective mind of the control system speaks to us and creates a, uh, this uh, moonopoly, as uh, Neil Haig calls it, which is this society that goes round and round and round and round as we react and respond in incredibly predictable ways. It's amazing, you know, how you can go anywhere in the world under so many different cultures and backgrounds, and yet you have a situation, it might be in a bar, in the street, or wherever, and the number of times you see people react in exactly the same way. And if you type data into a computer and then press enter, you know how it's going to react because you've programmed it to react like that. And every computer is going to react the same because the same data is going in. And enter is the reaction. And because we've fallen so much into the computer, body computer level of perception, we do the same. A situation emerges in this country or that country, and bingo, the reaction is the same. Why? Because consciousness is not involved, it's data in, situation, computer reacts, press enter, and that's why human responses are so predictable. When you open to consciousness, you become unpredictable. Because you're entering the realm of all possibility. And all possibility is not predictable. It sees things in different ways. And it expresses uniqueness and celebrates uniqueness. And it moves out of the computer level of reaction and response. Belief and preconceived idea is just like a computer program. Because it reacts the same and it edits reality. This is why you can talk to someone with a preconceived idea or a really strong belief and they literally don't hear what you say. I, I've seen um, um, television programs where what they did is they got a man and a woman who've been having like relationship problems and they both had big time preconceived ideas about each other. In other words, programmed uh, perceptions. What they did then was get them to talk to each other while they filmed it and then they took them away and they asked both of them what did the other one say and in what tone did they say it. They then played the original chat back to both of them and they were shocked to see that how they received what the other one said and how they said it was often nothing like had actually been said. How many times do we say to people, I never said that, you did. Why preconceived idea of the person is editing the information being received to fit the preconceived idea. And we're doing this all the time. So another part of freeing ourselves um, is to free ourselves from belief. Not free flowing, okay, I'm looking at this, this is what I feel at the time, but I'm open that it's something else in the light of new information. Instead of belief, rigid belief, I'm going to edit my reality to fit the belief. Where they want us to believe. Because when we believe, we are in a box. They want believers. They don't care if you believe fanatically in Islam or Judaism or Christianity or Barack bloody Obama. As long as you believe rigidly in something, then you have immediately reduced your ability to um, expand consciousness and read reality in an expanded way. Religion is mind. That's what it is. You see, once you have, I, I have this saying that I, that, that I have, if you can tell me what you believe, you are in a prison. Because beliefs, when you give them names, take on identities. So, um, what are you? I'm a Christian. Okay, that means you must believe this or you're not a Christian. I'm a, I'm a Muslim. That means you must believe this or you're not a Muslim. So once you say, here's the name of what I believe, the 
wall starts appearing, the rules and regulations appear, and people say, you can't say that, or you're not a Christian, you're not a Muslim. And again, the box is formed. Everything just is. We all just are. This is infinite possibility we're experiencing. And once you start to go into these systems of belief, then we're disconnecting from that and we become fragments of mind. This is a people in a hypnotist stage show who have been hypnotized, even though they're not, to believe that they are evangelical Christians. Right? It's a mind game. You can make people do this. And they will read reality like that. And therefore not be all possibility. Worship. I am all that is, has been, and ever can be. And, I, and I'm worshipping? And I'm looking up to something as if it's bigger and better than me? We are all the same one consciousness. And that one consciousness needs to look itself in the eye, not up there. We can respect people, fine. But giving our power away to them, worshipping them? Once we, we go into that mode, we're saying, I'm little me and they're up there. We're all one infinite consciousness, bar none. And these prisons, are, these are prisons of the mind, prisons of consciousness that keep us from consciousness. We call them religion, politics, race, the biggest one, self-identity, that hold us in servitude to little me, to limitation. I, I, um, I identify with my race. Why? It's a vehicle for your consciousness to experience this reality. What are you, what are you identifying with being black, white, or sky blue, pink for? It's just a vehicle. And it's all limitation. And when we see life through the tunnel vision of preconceived idea and rigid belief, we're never going to A, express our true magnificence, and B, we're never going to understand what the hell we're part of and what we're doing here. Because scientific experiments have shown that when you have a rigid belief system, whatever it is, the neurons in the brain fire off in a certain pattern. And in doing so, they are reading reality to fit the belief. And therefore, if we um, th think in any belief system or perception system in the terms of limitation and little me, then what we create is the prison walls that put us in positions where we live lives of little me. Not because we are, because we believe we are. What can I do? I'm just little me. Well, there, well, that's it then. What are you going to do with your life? Nothing. Why? Because you don't believe that that's possible. I am infinite consciousness, all that has been, ever will be. Now I can, cut, I can, I can start to, to come from that level instead of little me, and I can do things that a little me mentality would never do. Not because I'm better than little me, but because I don't believe I'm little me. And this one does. So if we open our minds, open our minds and let the demons out, the demons of programming, I mean, out, and get this blank sheet of paper going, I am not going to read reality on what I've thought up to now, I'm gonna let the information be my guide. And if it is at odds with my religious belief system, my political belief system, or my cultural belief system, then I'm, that's fine, but I'm gonna go with information. And when we do that, it makes such a fantastic difference in our lives and what we can do and what we can, what we can achieve and make happen. Because if we are at our core, as we are, the real us, all possibility, then if we don't express that, then we're already withdrawing from what we are, all possibility, and we're living a few possibilities, very few in terms of many people. And it's the time to choose between 
whether we're going to be dominated by the head, particularly the left brain, its perception of reality, limitation, structure, everything apart from everything else. You can't do this. That's not possible. That's impossible. Or we're going to open the heart vortex that connects us with the intuitive uh, knowing of the infinite consciousness. Open the right brain and let its ability to see things connected to impact on our understanding of reality and who we are. And it, the, the, the process was described very well in the Matrix movie, the first one. The first thing is to realize the situation that we're in. It is what it is. You are a slave, Neo. Get out of the denial of this pseudo freedom that we think we have. And then, having realized the situation we're in, to choose freedom over continued slavery, whether it be a blatant slavery or subtle slavery. And when we make that choice to be free, and we're prepared to go with what life then brings us as a result of that decision, then a transformation starts. And it can, I mean, in my case, my transformation happened on national television. Um, and I, I, I went through this period where they, it was widely believed that I was completely crazy, insane and all that stuff. You've ruined and finished your life, they said. You'll never go anywhere now. Right, okay, we'll see about that, shall we? And the transformation is breaking down the energetic construct that we have created by our previous sense of self. Our state of being, our mental emotional state, our self sense of perception is being broadcast constantly as a vibrational pattern. And that vibrational pattern is drawing to us um, energy fields that sync with what we're putting out. We call these energy fields people, places, ways of life, jobs, locations. And so we create a life experience based on what we're putting out and what we're drawing in through what I call vibrational magnetism. When we go through this transformation that I'm talking about where we say, I can see the situation I'm in, I choose freedom, then there is a change often dramatic, not always, a change in our vibrational broadcast state because we have changed our attitude, we have changed our sense of perception. And what happens then is what we were pulling in before changes because we're no longer sinking with that. And what can happen in these transformational periods, and there'll be people in this room will be going, that happened to me, that happened to me, that did, um, is people go out of your life because you're no longer connecting them vibrationally. Locations change. Jobs change. What you do, lifestyles change. Everything can change once you change because we are creating that reality by drawing it in. And this is why the control system wants us to believe we are little me. I have no power. Because when we believe that, we are putting out a vibrational pattern that says, I'm little me, I have no power. What do we draw into our lives? Manifestations of little me and I have no power. So that's why they're trying to program us to believe in that because they know we'll then create it in the holographic reality. And when we, when we can go, we go through some of these transformations and we're breaking out of the whole patterns, it can be frustrating. There was a time in the early 90s where I was so frustrated, so almost crushed by what was happening to me that I didn't want to upset anybody. So I found this hill in a place called Wiltshire in England, not far from uh, Stonehenge. And I walked up this hill. There's nobody, no houses behind. And when I got to the top, I screamed my bloody heart out just to get this frustration out of me. And I, so I completely re relate to these pictures from the Matrix because I've been there. And once we start to awaken, we start to, as they say, know thyself. And stop relating with David Icke and Charlie Smith and all these names that we give to our experience. 
and start to connect with the true magnitude of who we are. This is who we are. Everything from the beginning, my birth, my ancestors, my children, my wife, everything comes together simultaneously. I saw everything about me and about everyone who was around me. I saw everything they were thinking now, what they thought then, what was happening before, what was happening now. There is no time. There is no sequence of events. There's no such thing as limitation of distance, of period, of time, of place. I could be anywhere I wanted to be simultaneously. That is who we are, and that is what the control system is desperate to stop us remembering. And when we know thyself and we realize that's who we are, our perception of our possibility just explodes. People say to me, why don't they kill you? Because they can't. That's why. They can't. And I'm not kidding. If they cannot enter my decoding system, as being able to remove me, they cannot remove me. Because if I don't decode it, it cannot manifest holographically. And when, you know, I, years ago when I traveled America in the 90s, and I met loads and loads of whistleblowers and people that were putting information out, and they were, they were invariably, they were going, I don't know how long they'll let me do this before they kill me, and, and all this stuff. And I'm thinking, what are you talking about? You're going to create your own reality if you're not careful. All those people are either dead or have had their lives destroyed financially by the system. Why? Because they believed it was possible. Therefore, they decode it into holographic reality. Bingo, it's happened. We need to redefine ourselves, not from I can't. To, to the true magnitude of who we are, not just as a concept, but living it, bringing it into this reality. And then we'll see where the power is. And it's not with a few dark suits in some government department. It's here. That's where the power is. And as we redefine ourselves from little me, I'm just a human, to I am infinity having an experience as a human. No more little me, no more control system. One depends on the other for their existence. Instead of looking at the, in the mirror and saying, that's me, with all its limitations and, oh my goodness me, I'm losing my hair and all that stuff, to seeing that that's a reflection of the vehicle through which we are experiencing this tiny frequency range we call the world. To stop looking in the mirror and identifying with that is who we are and realizing that that is who we are. What that near-death experiencer describes is who we are. This is the choice. This is that fork on the road at the start of the day. Are we going to be consciousness or mind? Are we going to be all that is or little me? And if we choose all that is or anything like it, then the control system's over. Escaping the box. First of all, stop lying to ourselves. That's how we escape the box, one of them. There's this uh, thing that they call cognitive dissonance. And what that means is that you have a belief system and you come across an experience or information that puts a challenge on that belief system. And you go into an un uneasy emotional state because there is a difference between your belief system and the information or experiences you're ha you've had. And they call this uneasy state in psychology cognitive dissonance. This is a good thing if this makes us go, hold on a second, in the light of this new information or this experience, I've got to look again at my belief system. That's fine. That's brilliant. That moves us on. What so many people do, not least the skeptics as they call them in science and stuff and religious fanatics, is when they come across this situation with cognitive dissonance, they have to find a way of explaining away that so this does not move. And at that, because of that, they don't move on. They find a way of explaining why, why that, that can be true and this can be true. They're lying to ourselves. 
So with our belief systems and the way we see the world, if we can be honest with ourselves and say, okay, I believe this up to this point, but in the light of new information, I'm going to move my perception. That's when we start to move on and expand. And without being honest with ourselves and without hiding from the truth while claiming to try to find it and going into denial, change the subject, don't want to talk about it. Yeah, isn't it funny? And people in this room will relate to this. When you talk to someone who has a rigid belief system, maybe it's in your own family or whatever, and when you start to give them information that's putting their belief system under challenge, they get angry, some of them. They get wound up. Shut up! Shut up! Don't want to hear it! Don't want to hear that nonsense! What they mean is, if I listen, this belief system's going to be in danger, so shut up, because I don't want my belief system to change. This is what I mean by being honest with ourselves, to, to, to be open to all possibility instead of defending preconceived ideas that we've had in our life up to this point. It is what it is. And if we find new information and we think, well, I've been a Christian all my life and now I can see that, that, that there's more to know than that, or I've been a Muslim all my life, and this, then that's brilliant. Instead of saying, I have to defend my belief system because then I, because if I don't, I've got to admit to myself that I've been believing something I now know not to be true all these years, then, then, then we, we don't move on. But if we say, hey, this is fantastic. I can, I can see life in a different way now. That's wonderful. Instead of being embarrassed because um, we, we suddenly realize that we've, we've not seen the world as it really is up to this point. None of us have. <laughs> None of us know what there is still to know. And this is the other thing about fear. This says, be afraid, very afraid, the big bag monster's coming. All these things, they get to frighten us. So a key way of taking our freedom back is to let go of fear. Because it's fear that's being fed to us all the time to keep us in vibrational servitude. No more Fear. Here's an example of where the power is if we'll just let go of fear and programming. You see all these sheep. They're being controlled by two shepherds and a sheepdog. Why? Because they're just following the shepherd, the authority figure, and any that choose kind of to challenge that, then the sheepdog comes in, wrote, 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 symbolizing fear and they get into line. And here's these sheep, hundreds of them, walking down the bloody road, controlled. They might be going to the slaughterhouse, they don't know. Now what if not even all of them, what if just a number of them said, I'm not following that guy in front anymore. I don't want to do that, I'm going this way. And then the sheepdog comes up, row, 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 just go away, okay? Relax, chill out, go. Now, suddenly, this massive group of sheep that were being controlled by acquiescence and fear, what do the shepherds do? There's nothing they can do. It's over. They've got no control. The sheep are going off in all directions. What do the shepherds do? What can we do? And the only thing that's changed is the perception of the sheep to the, to, 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 um, the authority figures, which is we're not going to acquiesce to this anymore. And then when they try to frighten you like the sheepdog, you don't acquiesce to that. It's over. And that's what we can do, the human herd that we've allowed ourselves to become. It's just a choice. Albert Einstein said, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. But that's what we do. There's a wonderful phrase, if, you've, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. And it was always so. So if we're going to change um, the situation we're in, we have to change the way we do things, the way we perceive things. Because when we do, what we experience must change. We're all possibility. And therefore, if we're going to connect with that level of self, we need to express all possibility. Instead of doing what the majority do, what the herd do, 
express our uniqueness and the herd starts to break up. Go in a different direction if that's what you feel. Just because everyone's going in that direction doesn't mean that you can't go in another direction. And, and as this um, happens and you show it's possible, then more and more people see, actually, you can express uniqueness. It's fine. You don't have to be a, a clone of, 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 of the rest of humanity. And they start expressing their uniqueness in the, re, in the uh, response to your example. We can lead rather than follow. It's all possible for all of us. There was that wonderful um, movie uh, called The Dead Poets Society with um, Robin Williams, where he was a teacher in this stuck-up, staid system private school in America. And he was telling the pupils from these uh, you know, rich homes where they're brought up as clones they are and programmed from birth, perhaps more than anybody. And he was saying, you don't have to be like everybody else. As he said at one point, he stood on the desk in, uh, in the classroom and he said, I stand upon my desk to remind myself that we must constantly look at things in a different way. You see, the world looks very different from up here. You don't believe me? Come and see for yourselves. And it was funny uh, and very symbolic in the film because he told the, all the boys to each get in line, get on the, on the desk and jump off and just look at the, the, the classroom from a different... And, and a lot of them, even though he was the teacher and he said, you know, you're fine to do it, they were like, you know, kind of reticent to do it because it was so different. You don't do this in a classroom. You do what you bloody like in a classroom. It's a choice. And when we look at life from that level, we see symbolically from the desk a completely different world. We break out of the limitation. We connect with the true nature of who we are. And another thing to, to, to break down these barriers and allow us to be what we already are is to clear our mind of all the clutter and rubbish that means nothing. It doesn't matter. I have this thing that, about being on, being on your deathbed with 10 minutes to live. And you look back through your life and you say, what mattered? You know, when, you know when you had that massive row with that woman in 1963? Does it matter now? No. It's irrelevant. It doesn't matter. And what about this and that? And the, oh, no, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I, I just see what life's about now. And it's, it's not about any of this stuff and all this rubbish and conflict that I got, that we, I got involved in. The trick is to take that perspective and bring it into everyday life. It's a real challenge because the system is set up to keep us in, that, in those modes where we think things that don't matter are really, really important. But they don't, and they clutter up our minds. They clutter up our perception. The other thing I, I talk about is combing the mirror. This is a, a, a really important uh, way that we go the wrong direction in terms of trying to bring change in our lives. If you want to comb your hair, you don't comb the mirror. You comb your hair, and then the mirror reflects it. What we are manipulated to do by not understanding reality is to continually comb the mirror, trying to change. In other words, we're trying to change things out there when there is no out there. And instead, we ignore where out there, symbolically, is actually coming from. It's like you're in a movie theater, and you don't like the film. You don't like the movie. So what you do is you go up to the, to the screen where the movie's playing and you shout and you cuss and you demand that the, the movie change. Well, it's not going to change, is it? Because by the time it's hit the screen, it's a done deal. If you want to change the movie, you have to go back to the projection room and change the reel which is being projected onto the screen. Then you can change the movie. Now, that is very symbolic of, um, of this. Everything is happening on a vibrational level, both in terms of um, the world and ourselves. Um, battery's getting low, ego. Um, so here is symbolically the projector. It's here at the vibrational level that the information is decoded through to the holographic level, and this is the screen in the movie theater this physical world. 
And what we're trying to do is change this world out there. No chance. By the time it hits this holographic world, it's a done deal. We're experiencing it. If you want to change what's happening here, we have to change what's happening here, which is what we call the subconscious level, and therefore change what's on the screen. There are some psychologists who believe from their experience that about 98% of behavior and decisions to behave in certain ways here uh, start out in the unconscious mind, not in the conscious mind. This is interesting. They've done scientific experiments where they, um, they have a, a little bell or a sound and they say, when the sound goes, hit this button. And they are monitoring brain activity and other bodily activity when it's happening. And what they found is that the brain uh, changes, the electrical changes to make that happen, happen before the sound has gone off. In other words, it's, it started on a subconscious level. I would go further than 98%, my view is anyway, that 100% of decisions made in this reality are not made by the conscious mind. They're made through the conscious mind by the subconscious mind. And of course, we talk about subconscious, it's just subconscious to the conscious. It's conscious itself if you are accessing that level. And so people then ask the question, well, if everything's coming from my, my unconscious mind, from this perspective anyway, the vibrational level of being rather than the holographic, how do I know what's going on in there so that I can change? Well, it's something I call the language of life. And these are things that happen in your holographic experience which show you what's happening in here, where it's all coming from. If we are decoding information in this level of self into this level of self holographically, then what is happening here must be a mirror of what's going on in here. It has to be. And so if we want to know what's happening here, we have to look at what's happening here. What are the patterns in our lives? Do the, does the same thing keep happening? Do you keep drawing into your life the same kind of person that causes you the same problems? Um, and so on and so forth. Um, why, did this, why does this not, it never work for me and it works for that person, but it doesn't work for me? And if we read the language of life and what life is telling us, we can, we can change here by seeing what's going on in the play out world. And one of the things that I, I see is when we have a preconceived idea of what we want to do with our lives, there's nothing wrong with that as long as we hold it in a fluid state. But I see people, I know people in my own life, who they decide, I want to do this. And the door to doing that will not open. And instead of saying, language of life, okay, this is not working, so maybe, maybe that's not for me. It's not, oh, I want to be this. And you bang on the bloody door and no one opens it and it gets more and more frustrating and then you know they put stuff more stuff at the door and you're still trying to get in because you've got a preconceived idea this is what I want to do with my life I want to be a and yet over here all the time you're getting frustrated that this won't happen there's a door swinging open and saying over here over here this is for you and one of the things that I, I've learned in the last 20 years is that if it flows, then you're on the path. If you find blocks put in the way, then there's something not right either about what, where you're going or how you're going there. And um, we have this uh, thing we call intent, which is very, very powerful intent. But if your intent is at odds with the, your natural flow of where your life is meant to go, then intent and the flow go to war with each other and that's pushing you in that direction and you're banging on this door that won't open. The, the, the trick is if you can um, sync your intent with the flow of where life is taking you and you're quite happy to go where life is taking you um, rather than have preconceived outcomes all the time. I must be A, I must do A. And when those, uh, I know in my own life, once you, once you 
you realize where your life's going and you're at peace with going there. I wanted to be a professional footballer and then in television and all the rest of it. But my life took me in this direction and I, I went with it. My intent and my direction and my natural flow of my life were together and they just opened doors. Literally amazing adventures that put things in, in, in your path. And I've said here, flow equals go, stuck equals chuck. And what I mean by that is if, if life's flowing synchronistically and it's all happening in this synchronistic uh, way of coincidences and all the rest of it that take you in a certain direction, then that's the flow. If things are getting in the way of where you want to go and what you want to do, either that's not for you or you need to go about it in a different way. That's what the language of life that's telling you that. And <clears throat> what, we are, um, what we can do when we open ourselves to going where the flow of life is taking us is we can join the adventure. What's happening now? What's happening next? Isn't this wonderful? Instead of trying to uh, have a preconceived idea that's immovable. Another thing that gives us our freedom back is taking responsibility for our lives. My goodness me, we don't like doing that. Um, as Carl Jung said, um, people will do anything, no matter how absurd, in order to avoid facing their own soul. Um, what, um, what people don't like doing is saying, I'm responsible for my life. I might not like what's happening, but I have to take responsibility for it. Uh, because what that's saying is, I'm taking responsibility for what's happening in my life, and you know why? Because I have control over my life. And therefore, I can take responsibility for this thing I don't like, and I can make it into something I do like. What we're saying when we're trying to blame everybody for what's happening to us we, uh, including the control system, by the way, because the control system can only control because we allow it. We're responsible, really. Um, when we say you're responsible for what's happening in my life and you're responsible and that what you did in 1952, that's what happened. That you were responsible for what's happened to me since. What we're saying very clearly is I have no power. I have no power over my life. External people and influences do. And therefore, we live lives of powerlessness. Taking responsibility for what's happening to us, instead of saying it's all your fault to everything that happens in our life, is not weakness, it's the ultimate strength. It's saying, I have power over my life, so I'm responsible for creating this and drawing it into my life. I, can, I then have the power to change it. And we, we ask this question, why me? Why is it happening to me? It's a good question, why? Why is it happening to you and not to someone else? Like I say, we draw in, in people, places, jobs, and locations, that, with energy fields that sync with what we're putting out. And therefore, we attract things into our lives. There's no such thing as good luck or bad luck. Only what we draw in and what we don't draw in. What we create into our lives and what we don't. So, why me? Well, that's the question. Why you? Because it was our choice to come into this reality at this time. There was no, there's nobody on another dimension with an AK-47 saying to consciousness, get in that body or I shoot. So why are we here now? It's like the, the Oracle said in the Matrix movie to Neo, you've already made the choice, now you have to understand it. You didn't come here to make the choice, you've already made it. You're here to try to understand why you made it. As the, um, I was told through that psychic 20 years ago, arduous seeking is not necessary. The path is already mapped out. You only have to follow the clues. We are guiding you along a set path. And the clues are the language of life. Where are the coincidences and the flows and the synchronicity taking you and where are they not? Well, just go with where they're taking you and bingo, they'll take you somewhere. The, the, the thing is that we make the choice in the realms of expanded consciousness that the near-death experience was talking about and we try to understand that choice whilst in the limitations of the lens, the body computer. So we say, oh, I'd, never have, I'd never have agreed to this. I never chose this. 
Well, actually, you didn't choose that at that level of awareness that's saying you wouldn't choose it. A much more expanded level of you chose it. Now you have to understand why you chose it and get from it what you've come to get from it. So collectively, why us? Why are we here and not other expressions of consciousness in this world called humans at the time that all this is going on? Same answer. You've already made the choice, now you have to understand it. You didn't come here to make the choice, you've already made it. You're here to try to understand why you made it. Why are we here? Well, we're here, and at the same point applies, of course. We made the choice to be here, collectively and individually, from that state of awareness, and we try to understand it from this state of awareness. And that's why the more we expand our consciousness while in the body, the more we start to understand why we made the choice, because we're starting to connect to that level that made the choice. And I would say we're here to help to break the spell. And on another level, we're here to experience this extraordinary time of epoch change. And in, within the virtual reality game, we're here to break the spell of programmed humanity and change the nature of the experience here in what we call Earth. And we're here to do it. I don't care if you sweep the streets or you work for the government. We're all here at this time because we chose to be here. And in this period coming up, as the control system throws its last desperate effort to hold on to its power, it will seem for a few years that it's actually getting more control. But it's, it's the death throes. It will be a mistaken view that it, it's getting more power. It just appears to be it's desperately trying to hold on to a control that is in the process of being removed. And in this period, we're going to face everything you can think of, everything they can think of to destabilize us emotionally and in all the other ways, whether it's vaccines, economic crashes, conflicts, whatever. And if we fall in this period into mind perception and five sense perception, it's going to be a very challenging time in this next little period as, as, as we, we go through this change. If we can hold the fact that we are consciousness having an experience, then going through these challenges are going, is going to be far easier. There's a great line of freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. So many people are not free because they have something to lose or they, they think they have. They have a big house, they have money or power or prestige. And that because they fear losing that, they don't have the freedom to be themselves because they're fearful that they will lose it if they, if they upset certain people by expressing what they really think as opposed to being a clone of the people they're frightened of upsetting. And there's this uh, proverb that says, just when the caterpillar thought life was over, it became a butterfly. And that's where we are in humanity now. We're breaking out of the caterpillar period and we are starting to fly symbolically as we expand our awareness to realize who we really are. And I, I would emphasize this. It's not that this control system and this reptilian element or any of it is all powerful or omnipotent. They're not. Anything that wants power over and is in the fear that this control system mechanism is in, desperate not to be uh, uncovered because of the consequences, then you are in a low vibrational state. You have a limitation of how far you can get out and connect with higher levels of perception, awareness and potential. For that state of being to control humanity, they have to put humanity in a lower state of awareness than they're in. It's not that they're omnipotent and all-powerful and all-knowing. Are you kidding? Nothing that's all-knowing wants to do what they're doing. What they've had to do is put us in a smaller box by suppressing knowledge and all the rest of it we'll be talking about today. So when we awaken, we have the capacity to expand our consciousness, our awareness, because we don't want control over other people. 
and, and all the things that, that, that the control system wants and is in fear of losing and all the insecurities that come with that. So we can actually expand our consciousness in a way that the control system mechanism cannot. We can access levels of awareness, perception, understanding, insight, inspiration that they can't. And it's, it's, a, it's a real testament to our true nature of the amazing lengths they have to go to keep us under control, especially in this period as we're awakening. Our na natural, the natural state of a ball in a tank of water is to float on the top. To put it in an unnatural state, you have to push it down and hold it at the bottom. You can't then let go because it's boom in its natural state immediately. You have to hold it down there. Our natural state is infinite awareness. And so to hold us symbolically at the bottom of the tank, they're having to throw everything at us. Look at it. Programming through words, programming through education, programming and manipulation through food, through drink, increasingly chemtrails, harp, all the amazing explosion of things to hold us in an unnatural state. And it's just a matter of time before it's no use and will no longer work. This says, okay, I'm waking up, so what do I do now? Well, this is the first thing. Stop making excuses. I, you know, all over the world, there's people that have woken up and they've seen that what's happening is not what they thought it was and not what they want it to be. But then, they do nothing. They find excuses not to do anything. And if you uh, awaken to seeing what's happening and do nothing, then don't complain when it moves on. It's like I find, you know, the forums on the internet, there's some great work done on forums um, in terms of exchanging information. And um, on YouTube, there's some wonderful people around the world that put these packages together um, of, of, of interviews by people like me and others who are explaining it, and they put pictures to them, and they put them out. And it, they, it's wonderful what they do to um, put these packages on different subjects for people and introduce them to the subject for the first time. But then you see people on conspiracy website forums who they, they can see what's going on to an extent, otherwise they wouldn't be there. But what do they do? They just hurl abuse at each other all day. You know, it's like, okay, you know what's going on uh, to an extent. What are you doing to make a difference? Well, I'll go on the forum under my login name, Bong Bong, <laughs> and I'll say what I think. Bong Bong, yes. Bong Bong postings. I'm very famous on the forum. <laughs> what do you mean you're very famous? Bong Bong doesn't exist. Why, why don't you use your own name, go out there under your own name, and speak your truth? Well, I find that if you use your own name, people tend to know who you are. Exactly. And then somewhere else on the World Wide Web is another warrior stirring. I see that bong bong's at it again. I'm going to go on the forum under my login name, woo woo two. Somebody already had woo woo. <laughs> And I'm going to give that bong bong a piece of my mind. Well, you can't give him a piece of something you don't have, mate, please. I mean, let's be fair. But you see this all the time on the internet. People just hurling at people. I know more about this. I know more about 9-11 than you do. Tosser, idiot, prat, and all this business. And the control system moves on. And I can understand people who, who are close to what's happening in the world who do nothing. They don't think there's anything to do anything about. But those who have woken up to an extent and are still doing this rubbish, this self-obsessed nonsense and making no difference at all, because it's easy to do that, I'm bong bong there. No one knows who bong bong is. To go out and speak your truth and stand for what you believe in, that's different. And if the control system wants us to shut up, 
then we have to shout louder. That's how change comes about. Non-acquiescence. Human race, get off your knees. What are you doing down there? Your infinite awareness, what are you on your knees for? On your knees to politicians, to police state, to religions, what's going on? It's like Martin Luther King said, a man can't ride your back unless it's bent. And we need to stop bending our back. And I say this to these, these people in uniform, in the dark suits, in the administration of government, and in the uniforms of the military. You too have children and grandchildren that this control system is aimed at um, enslaving. How, how, what are you going to say to your children when they say, uh, Mommy, Daddy, Granddad, Grandma, what were you doing when the control system came in? Well, actually, I was helping to bring it in, dear. I mean, and there's some people going to have to face that, but what we can do is say now, we're not doing it anymore. To withdraw from these uniform professions, or at least refuse to do things that we know are unjust and are about control and suppression and not about justice. And what's wonderful, I have to say, is that more and more people in the system are starting to break ranks. It's just starting to become evident. And so when they, when they break ranks, the pyramids are in desperate trouble. Because this is what they want to do to our kids and our grandkids. And we can play a part in it, or we can stand up and say we're not having it. And this is like this says, join the army, vac vacancies available. I'm digging my own grave, but soon it will be your turn. What can we do when we start to wake up? We can stop joining the military and becoming a pawn in the control systems game of playing one military against another military to create change in the world that is designed to enslave the children and grandchildren of those that are shooting at each other. As Einstein said, the pioneers of a warless world are the youth that refuse military service. And they are the adults that support them in that. Instead of calling them cowards and all the rest of it, supporting them in anything but cowardice which is standing up and saying we're not doing it anymore there are some fantastic young people in israel jewish kids who are refusing to join the israeli army by conscription uh not conscription by force that um then goes and does things to the palestinians they won't do it and these kids are going to jail for periods for it fantastic that's what makes the difference not moaning know thyself Know thyself. Fighting is mind. Consciousness doesn't pick up a gun and start shooting at another expression of consciousness. Mind does that. So anyone who thinks that fighting and violence is a way forward is in mind, not consciousness. What you fight, you become. It's the same with um, violent rebellion against the system itself. If you, if you bring in a change through violence, you're just going to create another society that mirrors the one you've just removed. What you fight, you become. You see this all the time. Where people fight a perceived injustice and use the same methods that the injustice is using. This sort of stuff is a meeting of mind. And the control system doesn't uh, worry about protest to extent freedom fighters that's a lovely one contradiction in terms you don't fight for freedom you express your freedom you don't fight for peace you peace for peace that's how peace comes about cognitive dissonance lying to ourselves we fight for justice we fight for peace no we don't we fight to fight and create more conflict Martin Luther King said, the limitation of riots, moral questions aside, is that they cannot win and their participants know it. Hence, rioting is not revolutionary but reactionary because it invites defeat. It involves an emotional catharsis but it must be followed by a sense of futility. Like I said, um, this is not about hating that which enslaves us. Otherwise, we become that which enslaves us. 
we have to meet it with a different um, energy to what it's putting out. Otherwise, we become what it is. And in terms of protests, you know there was a million people on the streets of London protesting before the Iraq invasion, protesting against the invasion of Iraq. What did they do? They invaded Iraq. How many protests have there been about globalization? What happens? Globalization gets faster and faster and faster. And in so many ways, protests can be what I've symbolized here, a steam whistle, a way of letting off steam and taking out anger from, from opposition, but nothing changes. They're not frightened of that. What they're terrified of is this, humanity coming together putting down the irrelevant manufactured fault lines of different religious beliefs and political beliefs and cultures and income brackets and uniting behind something that affects us all the fact that our basic freedoms are being withdrawn and are planned to be massively more withdrawn than they already have been because this is not a conspiracy to enslave Jewish people or Muslims or middle-class Americans or South African uh, blacks. This is a conspiracy to enslave all of us and therefore we all need to come together to be united behind what affects us all. Martin Luther King said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So often you see people, oh yeah, well that doesn't affect me. It's an injustice, yes, it doesn't affect me. Oh, that doesn't affect me and that doesn't affect me. And then eventually it does affect you because of the process that you've allowed to happen by saying it's not my problem. It's like that pastor said in Nazi, or after Nazi Germany. He said, first they came for the Jews and I was not a Jew, so I did nothing. Then they came for the communists and I was not a communist, so I did nothing. Then they came for the trade unionists. I was not a trade unionist, so I did nothing. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak out for me. And what's happening now around the world is they're picking off different sections. They're picking off the Muslims in this area and that area. They're picking off these people in this level and middle class Americans and all that stuff. And everyone's going, it's not my problem. We'll leave them to it. If we are going to live in a just world and a free world, everyone else's injustice must become our injustice. And we must stand by other people, even though that we're not affected by it. As King said, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. And we all need to become each other's friend. Silence is consent. Can you hear us now? And it is. Silence is consent. This control system has reached its, its, its point that we're facing now because so many people have looked the other way and been silent. Enough. If you want to be free, then don't run and hide. This is why opening to consciousness and coming from the full under, an understanding of the true nature of who we are, consciousness having experience is so important because then we don't run away and hide. Because, okay, you know, we lose our lives, fine, okay, uh, and I've just gone from uh, limitation to all those things the near-death experience have talked about. I'm terrified. Not that they can do it, they can't, unless I allow it. Mahatma Gandhi said, strength does not come from physical capacity, from, but from an indomitable will. Isn't it amazing how you see extraordinary feats of physical bravery? that soldiers do in Afghanistan in the Second World War. Amazing feats of amazing physical bravery, and yet they're terrified of saying boo to someone in a uniform with more stripes on their shoulder than they've got. Strange. But that's what we do. An indomitable will is not just a physical will. It's a, if you like, a moral will not to be, not to be acquiescent to authority just because it seems to have more power. As this Turkish um, saying says, a lion sleeps in the heart of every brave man and woman. The lion sleeps in the heart of everybody. 
It's just gone to sleep. Know thyself. What is there to fear when you realize your consciousness, infinite, eternal consciousness? You can look at this and you can be uh, intimidated by it. Oh my God, look. These brainless people in uniforms with sticks, I'm terrified. Or you can do this. Eh? It's just a different perception of the same situation. The only way we can be controlled en masse is if we comply, to use this American word that keeps getting repeated, if we comply with what we're told we must do. If someone is in the parliament and they come out and they say, we've had a discussion and we've decided this is going to happen, if the people in enough numbers say, no, it's not, where's the power? The power is in acquiescence. Oh, well, I don't agree with it, but I suppose we better all do it. It's the law. Why? If it's unjust, if it's controlling, if it's suppressing. Because this is a, this is a, this tells the story, this. The pyramid. Where do we look at in a pyramid for power? We look there at the top where the eye is. Oh, there's the power in the pyramid. That's what we see in these structures. But look at it. They few are up there because these silly sods in vast numbers are here holding that up. When we walk out and say we're not complying with our own slavery any longer, there's a massive crash and that comes down. Because we, the people, are holding up the edifices of power that are dictated to us from the few from the top. These edifices of power are nothing more than a house of cards which we are holding together. When we say, I'm not holding this card together anymore, I'm not acquiescing with my own slavery, it's over. And change must take place, and that's what consciousness is going to bring. Simple example. In Britain today, they're fining people about 200 pounds for putting their trash can out on the wrong day or in the wrong place. 200 quid. And what happens? People go, it's terrible. That's big brother coming in. I think it's disgusting. And the next thing is, what's on the TV tonight? <laughs> now, what if instead of moaning, thousands of people in that area put their wheelie bins, their trash can, can, uh, cans out in the wrong place on the wrong day indefinitely until the law was changed. Doing it like that, the system couldn't cope. It can pick people off individually, yes, but together, we're not having this. They can't do it. We have the power. We've just given it away. This says your vote is your voice. Rubbish. If you've got the uh, choice between voting for this mask on that face and that mask on that face, there is no voice and there is no choice. We're not going to change this politically. We're going to change this by ceasing to acquiesce and cooperate with the system that enslaves us. If we won't comply, no, 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 the system can't function. That doesn't mean we, we don't comply with everything. There's lots of things that, okay, that's, that's all right. We should do that, and it helps to organize society. But imposition, control, suppression, injustice, no. In California now, there are hundreds of thousands of people a month losing their homes. And let's take this round, shall we? Why are you losing your home? I can't pay the mortgage. I can't pay the, 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 the bank. Why can't you pay the bank? Because there's been an economic depression and we've lost our jobs. Who caused the economic depression? The banks that are now taking your home away. And you're leaving? You're leaving? What are we doing? We, we face that injustice and we pack our bags and walk out what if those hundreds of thousands of people a month who've been subjected to that in one American state alone said, we ain't leaving. 
We're not leaving because the people making us leave are the people that have created the reason we have to leave. The system couldn't cope. It can pick people off individually. It can get people to do it en masse when they just acquiesce. When we say we're not having it in any like numbers, this is why coming together is so important, the system is impotent. It has no power. You must have compulsory vaccinations. No, no, no. Not having it. Look what happened last uh, year. All this hype about the swine flu. People said no. What happened? Nothing. What they wanted to do was not possible. Then they're trying to do it another way this year. You must do what we say, dark suits. Tell us. No. No, no. We will not acquiesce with our own slavery anymore. It's what I call the non-comply dance, where we dance to a different drum, we dance to a different beat. We no longer little me taking it from this edifice of apparent power. We're deciding our own destiny, our own lives. I am all that is. You cannot grant me my freedom, nor can you take it away because I am freedom. You in a dark suit think you can take my freedom away? Are you kidding? What would infinite consciousness do? What would infinite consciousness do in the situations we face? Well, this is what it would do. If it's not right, don't do it. If it's not true, don't say it. And you know what would change this world overnight? And this is where consciousness will come in and do this is if we made decisions based not on this perceived what is right for us in the situations we face every day, but we said, what is right? What is the right, just, and fair thing for me to do in this circumstance that I face? Because, what the, because of the, the control system and the way we perceive and survival and me, 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 what we're doing all the time in these situations, we're saying, what is the best thing for me here? What are the consequences for me? And so we're making decisions all the time, not based on what is fair and right and just, but what is best for us. And that's why we live in the world we do. If we change that and we say what is right and just and fair, that's what I'm going to do. Okay, I might make, not make so much money as I would if I did what was right for me, uh, uh, the best for me. But it's right and it's just and it's fair. Society would transform. If we want a world of peace, we need to be peaceful. It sounds trite and simple, but it happens to be true. If we're all peaceful with each other, we're in a world of peace. If we're all kind to each other, then, we, then we're in a world of kindness. We have the power. You know, we complain about wars, and yet we argue and fight among ourselves, which is just an individual version of the collective thing we call a war. When we change, the world must change. This is why consciousness, the expansion of consciousness is going to transform this world, because it's going to bring out a totally different perception and interaction and sense of values. As Martin Luther King said, cowardice asked the question, is it safe? Expediency asked the question, is it politic? Vanity asked the question, is it popular? But conscience asked the question, is it right? And there comes a time when must, one must take a position that is neither safe, nor politic, nor popular, but one must take it because it is right. And that's the consciousness shift that is going to change this reality from what it is to what it's become, going to become, and is becoming among many people. And it's a revolution of perception. The perception that says, hey, I am a lion. I'm not a lamb. I'm not little me. I'm something greater than I ever understood that I was. I'm not that. I'm that. I'm that. I am the lion, not the lamb. I have control over my own destiny. I will take that control. 
And when people do that, miracles become possible. Society cannot function as it has functioned so far when we shift our consciousness. There has to be a system failure in the vibrational, therefore digital, therefore holographic world. And we're being given the opportunity now with this truth vibrations and as it moves on and it's getting quicker all the time, the quickening, uh, to open the door, to open the lock, to open the key, to uh, say, as the poet Shelley said, the English poet, rise like lions after 